Good day, Josh Sepnick here with you on another episode of AM Refresh. So the first few episodes of AM Refresh, we covered some of the core doctrines of Christianity, starting with the Trinity, moving to the deity of Christ, the fact that Jesus is God. And moving on to the atonement, Jesus' a payment for our sin on the cross. And last time we did the resurrection. And these are all very important doctrines, but in one sense, they don't make sense if you don't have the proper worldview. And that's what I want to talk about today is having a Christian worldview. And I'm going to be going over a few points regarding that, many scriptures, some quotes, as always. But this is something very important because um, a lot of people say, well, why don't they believe this? Why is someone denying the resurrection of Christ? Why would someone say that Jesus was not God or that he was not always God or, he, you know, he was born? Uh, he was a created being. Or like some, I believe it's the Mormons that say that Jesus is a spirit brother of Lucifer. These crazy beliefs, why do people believe that? And really it has to do with their worldview. So I'm going to hop right into it. And I'm going to say that, and our first point is that the Christian worldview starts with the Bible. In fact, a Christian worldview is synonymous with a biblical worldview. There is no such thing as a non-biblical Christian worldview. Because Christianity is based off the Bible. So if you're talking about a Muslim, uh, they have an Islamic worldview that is driven by the Quran and the other writings of Islam. Same thing with a Hindu or a Buddhist with their writings, the Catholics or a Roman Catholic. Yes, they have a, a scripture there, Bible, with the Apocrypha in it, as well as the, writing, the, the writings of bishops and the current Pope and old Popes and all sorts of things that they consider uh, their catechism. And if you are a proponent of psychology, you have the writings of guys like Sigmund Freud, B.F. Skinner, Carl Jung, and many others that you would say would be sort of your scriptures that you would follow or base your teachings on. Christianity has the Bible. In John 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. Of course, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus was the Word made flesh. He was the Word of God to man. But he, he gave us the Bible. God gave us the Bible, and that is the written Word. John 17.17 17 says, Sanctify them with your truth. Your Word is truth. Psalm 119, 160 says, Your word, O Lord, is settled forever in the heavens. There's no change in God's word. Right? In Isaiah 40, it says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, we're told that the word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. And from that word, nothing is hid, but everything is laid bare uh, for the one to whom we have to give an account to. So, this word will one day judge us. And this word is what we need to judge our lives by and what Christianity is based off of. Again, you cannot have a Christian worldview without basing it on the Bible. It starts with the Bible and really ends with the Bible as the final authority. Uh, we must subject ourselves to the Bible because it is the word of God. Now, Jesus gave credit to the Bible. He quoted it many times. In the New Testament, he was constantly quoting scripture. And he's telling the Pharisees and these religious leaders, haven't you read this? Well, of course they've read it. They've been trained in it their whole lives. But he says, you err because you don't know the scripture. You don't know the power of God. You don't base your life off of it. You don't obey it. 
you twist it. So not only is the, the Christian worldview based on the Bible, but it's also based off of a proper response to the Bible of obedience to the word of God. And again, Jesus gives credit to the Bible. In Matthew 4, 4, he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He said that when he was tempted by the devil. Now he's quoting actually from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. So we're not just to live by physical food to keep us alive and nourish us, but spiritual food as well. Like it says in the book of Psalms 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And we do that by getting in his word. John 10, Jesus was talking to the religious leaders, having another confrontation with them. Which happened many times. And again, the interesting thing is that he always went back to scripture. That's where he got his authority from. But Jesus said to them, uh, he was debating about the law. And the, the, the Jews were saying they, he broke the law because he was claiming to be God. But Jesus said to them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. And that's, <laughs> that's a verse that's twisted many times. Uh, but anyways, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken. Jesus right there saying scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. So you have the Word of God who says that the Word of God cannot be broken. And they are accusing the Word incarnate of blasphemy and they don't even know the written Word. Matthew 5, Jesus is talking in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 Verses 17 and 18. Listen to this. Why did Jesus come? Did he come to get rid of the law? Did he come to get rid of the word of God or parts of it? Listen to this. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot. In another translation, it's not a jot or a tittle, just the smallest bit will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So scripture, Jesus was constantly quoting scripture. And some people say, well, you can't prove scripture by quoting scripture. And, and there are many proofs that scripture is the word of God. But the greatest proof is that the change of lives and the power of the word of God. Like Charles Spurgeon said, if you have a lion, you don't sit there and defend the lion. You let the lion loose. The lion defends itself. And that's the way it is with the word of God. We have to let that lion loose. And there's a place for apologetics. There's a place for knowing facts about how the manuscripts were preserved. The Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the accuracy between all of the copies that were found in the ancient manuscripts. There is a place for them, even archaeology and, and, and the different places in the scripture that were found and the things that were found to be true centuries and millennia later. But I will say this, ultimately, the word of God itself is its best authority, its own best authority. So it starts with the Bible. Number two, it saturates all of life. So it impacts all of your life. And the main reason for this is that it's God-centered. So your life is no longer about you, it's about God. So a long time ago, there were a group of men that came together. And these were men that were studied on, in the word of God. They were very brilliant. They, were, they loved God. And they said, they put together this thing called the Westminster Shorter Catechism, finished in 1647. So we're talking a good 375 years ago. And these guys came together and they said, they answered many questions. And one of them was, what is the chief end of man? Here's the answer they came up with. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And that is a powerful statement because it's starting with God and not with man. It's starting with the word of God 
but it's really starting and ending with God. It's very God-centered, the Christian worldview is. John Wesley is a great preacher, great uh, man, founded Methodism or helped found Methodism back in the 1700s. He said that man's chief end is that man might know and love and enjoy and serve his crea great creator to all eternity. So it ties in very closely, and Wesley would have probably been familiar with this confession and and uh, the 39 articles of uh, the Anglican Church and other things at that time that were very God-centered. Uh, <clears throat> the idea is worship. And the idea is of worship and the, the originality of that word, or the origin of that word, I should say. English major here, right? Uh, worth-ship is literally where that word came from, and then they just take took the T-H out and it became worship. But it's the worthiness of an object. So there's a, a sermon that some of you may have listened to, and if you haven't, you should listen to it <laughs> at least once in your life. It's called Ten Shekels and a Shirt by Paris Reedhead, and I'll put a link up to it uh, at the end of the video. But he talks about Christianity and the point of it and what it is opposed to, the viewpoint that is opposed to it. Here's what he has to say. Do you see? Let me epitomize. Let me summarize. Christianity says the end of all being is the glory of God. Humanism says the end of all being is the happiness of man. So he's saying humanism is in opposition. This idea that man is the center is in opposition to Christianity, where God and his glory is the center. He goes on to say, one was born in hell, the deification of man. The other was born in heaven, the glorification of God. One is a Levite serving Micah, and the other is a heart that's unworthy, serving the living God, because it's the highest honor in the universe. And it's statements like that that made many people say that there was the greatest sermon of the 20th century there. Uh, it, because it pointed out the flaw of humanism that came into the church in the 20th century and really how man became the center of it instead of God. And God always was the center of the church and the Christian church and Jesus Christ and him crucified because he is worthy. Many scriptures talk about this. In the Bible, I'm just going to read a handful, starting with Psalms. I, I love Psalms. If you ever just need some encouragement, some direction, I mean, there's 150 of these things, so read the Psalms. Psalm 145.3, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Uh, also in the Old Testament, First Chronicles 16.25 For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. And that is also repeated in Psalm 96.4. Second Samuel, <laughs> touching on some books we don't read a lot here, but we should. Because they have statements like this. Second Samuel 22.4 I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Uh, the book of Hebrews, another great book to read, especially if you're confused about salvation and the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant. Hebrews makes a lot of things very clear. And it elevates Jesus because the Lord Jesus Christ is the most important figure in history, and he is also the center of the Bible. It says, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. So the Lord Jesus is the one who made Moses. So just like the person who builds the house can receive the credit, and not the house itself, so the Lord Jesus receives the credit. He is the center. Moving on to the book of Revelation, I have a couple of scriptures from there. Revelation 4.11. 
Worthy are you, O our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Then Revelation 5.12. I'm going to go back to 11. We'll read 11 and 12. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So again, He is worthy. We are not. And I think that it was interesting as I was searching for scriptures, I was searching online for scriptures that talked about his worthiness, it was hard to find them because there were so many that wanted to talk. Literally, people had web pages just devoted to how we are worthy of God and God's love. And apart from God and Christ himself, we there, really there's nothing worthy in us. And we should not even focus on the fact that we are not worthy so much, although we should we need to recognize that. We need to focus on him. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great preacher of the last century, said, If we only spent more of our time looking at Christ, we should soon forget ourselves. And that's what true Christianity is. True humility, too, is just that forgetting more and more. He must increase, but I must decrease, like John the Baptist said. And he lost his head for that. But he realized Christ was the one that was important. He is worthy. Listen to his words in Matthew 10 as he's talking about the co cost of discipleship. Matthew 10, 37 through 39. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I'm not worthy of him. But he says, if you want to follow me, you need to do these things or you are not worthy of me, of the Lord Jesus. He says, whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. All right. Want to look quick at a uh, count here. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> this is, I want you to pay attention to this story because we have a couple instances of the word worthy in here, and I want to see who it's directed to. Luke 7, after he, after Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered uh, Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued by him. The centurion is a Roman leader who is uh, accountable for a hundred soldiers. He's in charge of a hundred soldiers. Hence centurion, like century, a hundred years. And, and we call it what, a century, but centurion. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He, that is the centurion, is worthy to have you do this for him. For he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. I want to stop right here. These people saying, the centurion is worthy. Now I will say, from a human standpoint, they were correct. For to say, Oh, I hope God blesses this person. Look at all they're doing for other people. <clears throat> That's certainly a noble cause. And I think in this place, I don't think that these people were wrong. But listen to the centurion's response. Verse 6, And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends. So these friends are speaking on behalf of this centurion. And these friends said to Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. 
Well, hold on here. These people are saying he's worthy for you to have him do this. <clears throat> this centurion who believes, who has saving faith in Christ, he's saying, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy for you to even come here under my roof. He knew. He said, this is the Messiah. This is God in the flesh. The centurion believed in him, and he knew that he was worthy, that God was worthy, that Christ was worthy, that he was not worthy to have him come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I, too, am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to you, to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. So it's interesting here because Christ healed him, and it was because of this man's faith. But it was not this man's faith in himself or this, his faith in his faith. It was his faith in, his, in Christ. And he recognized Christ's worthiness, not his own. So again, God-centered, God-saturated. That is the focus. I have to get moving on here. Point three, a Christian worldview stands against the culture. So there's a separation. All right, you see this in Israel. You see it. In examples of stories like uh, Elijah, the account of Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. He's after God consumed the water-soaked sacrifice of Elijah. He says, "All right, everyone who is for God, come over here and let's kill these prophets of Baal." Who's on God's side? Right? There's a hymn that I don't know. Maybe some of you are familiar with. Who is on the Lord's side? So there was a separation in Israel where God was separating them constantly from the nations around them because he wanted them to be stand away from those godless cultures who worshipped idols. The book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 11. And again, I apologize. I'm still getting used to working Esart here. Uh, it says, depart, depart, go out from there. God's talking to Israel. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. And then we're going to move to the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 20 and verse 41. As a pleasing aroma, God sang to Israel, as a pleasing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered. And I will manifest my holiness among you in the sight of the nations. And God, in a sort of physical, visible way, with the nation of Israel, is giving an example for what he will do in the new covenant with the church in separating them. The called out ones. The ecclesia is the Greek word which means called out, the separated church. And we get this idea also further in the book of 2 Corinthians 6, verse, verses 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And that verse 17 there is really a culmination. It's a combination of those two verses, Isaiah 52, 11 and Ezekiel 20, 40. But now this is talking <coughs> to the church, the called out ones. Don't be unequally yoked. Don't 
tie in with this world with unbelievers and business and living arrangements, marriage, the closest friends, those sorts of things. They need to be believers. Our time should be spent primarily with the church. Of course, there's evangelism. Of course, we have work and other things, but we need to spend as much time as we can with other believers. <clears throat> but yes, a separation from the world. And I want to get into some scriptures here. And John has a lot to say, both in his gospel and in the book of 1 John. It's actually Jesus talking here in the book of John, chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Again, chose out of the world, called out of the world. Ecclesia, church, called out ones. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. <laughs> if they kept my word, they will keep. they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. So again, Jesus saying, I called you out of the world, but the world will hate you. The world system, not the physical world, but the system of the world. And we'll get to that in a second. Jesus encouraging the believers, though he says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. <clears throat> so he's saying, I'm giving you peace, not like the world gives, but I'm giving you my kind of peace. Peace in the midst of difficulties. Uh, he reinforces this, John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And I remember Isaiah uh, 26, 3. He says, I will keep you in perfect peace. Keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on them. Those who focus on Christ will have perfect peace in him. Moving on to the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verse 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's very similar to that last verse I read from the book of John. Now the world system. John talks about it in 1 John 2, 15 and 16. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, listen to this, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Separating those two things, God's will and the world with its desires. And this is a very strong passage. In fact, I believe this was the passage that the great uh, Dr. R.A. Torrey ended up having on his tombstone. And he lived it. And will we live it? Stand against the culture. John, I forgot one verse back in John that I want to get to. Uh, John chapter 17 in verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Again, you're in one system or the other. You're in the system of Christ or you're in the world system. And Jesus saying, again, laying down those terms of discipleship. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? And we see that in the story of the rich young ruler in Mark 10, 17 through 27. Jesus said, you have to deny yourself. You have to give up everything for me and follow me. And that man was not willing to do it. And there will be opposition from the world. Uh, Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, just an amazing testimony, he talks about all the different things he went through, his suffering for Christ. Are they servants of Christ, talking about these false apostles <coughs> who are boasting and calling Paul a false apostle? He says, are they servants of Christ? <coughs> I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from all these things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant. <clears throat> he was treated like this because he was not a part of the world system, because he preached Christ and him crucified. He's a servant of Christ. And this, <clears throat> if you will, is his payback, all this danger and all of this tribulation. Like it says in the book of Acts, it's through many tribulations you have to enter the kingdom. Not that going through tribulation will save you, but when you are saved, you will go through many trials. And not only these dangers, but also even more dangerous, the false gospels and the false Christs. Second Corinthians, stick with that book, 4, verse 4. In this case, the God of the world... That Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Satan has blinded their minds. And given, so that's why they received many false gospels and false Christs. 1 John, back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. All right, Matthew 7 talks about this. Matthew seven thirteen through 23. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. In Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus is talking about the times near his return, and of course his return also, Matthew 24, verses 23 through 31. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. 
<coughs> for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So they, these false people, these false Christs, false teachers, false preachers, they will say, look, here's Christ. And they'll lead people astray by saying, they are the Christ, or by saying this person's the Christ, or this movement is of, and, and and they're saying, wait, Jesus Himself is saying, no, these things must happen first, and then He will return. Back to Second Corinthians, chapter eleven, verse four. Paul talking to the Corinthians. He says, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you have received a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. And he is saying that to their shame. <clears throat> Verses 12 through 15. What I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. <clears throat> For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. And last, but certainly not least, Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the gospel of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but that there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As I am saying, as I, we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Anathema, damned, literally, is the meaning of the word in the original language, in the Greek. <clears throat> so, almost more dangerous, really, and I would say, actually, it is more dangerous than that persecution, is this deception, the false gospels, the false Christ, the false spirits. But the most important thing is that we are for Christ and know him in the, the true Christ. Matthew 12, 30, Jesus lays down the ultimatum. He says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. So he says, you're either with me or you're against me. And if someone is for him, we should not be against them. There are still 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal, like God told Elijah. And the thing is that even though sometimes we want to say, well, we're right about every little thing, the thing is that the Christian worldview is based off of the truth of God's word and the essentials of the Christian faith. But there are many things that are not essential and that, that, are, that, are, that have been disagreed on for years. Now, yes, there is only one meaning, but because we are humans, we do not completely understand it. But we must focus on the main things. And that's what I hope to do with this video series. Uh, A.W. Tozer said that the Christian church is like a body with a lot of organs. And, and the, there are only certain ones that are vital to existence. But there are other things like a man can lose his, his toe or his leg or whatever and still live. And it's the same thing with some of those doctrines. Although we do need to study to show ourselves approved and to not be deceived and to not be carried away with this culture because 
the biblical worldview, the Christian worldview, stands against the culture. And finally, the Christian worldview is spiritual in nature. It's not physical or political. In Ephesians 6, verse 12, Paul says, tells the Ephesians that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. When Pilate was asking Jesus if he was a king, Jesus said, of course, he said that he came to bear witness to the truth, but he also said his kingdom was not of this world, and that if his kingdom was of the world, that his soldiers, or that his followers, excuse me, would fight. They would fight like soldiers. But they didn't. In fact, when one of them tried to, he rebuked them. When Peter tried to cut off the high priest's servant's ear, Jesus rebuked Peter, and he, he healed the servant's ear, and then Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And it says in another translation, it's probably more popular in our hearing, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Jesus' kingdom is not is, is, is spiritual in nature. It's not physical. It's not political. It's not mental. Although it can affect those things primarily in nature, it is spiritual. And that's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 21, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It, that obviously can be misinterpreted and has been misinterpreted many times, but he's saying that kingdom of God rules in the hearts of those who submit to it. That's those who realize their need for him, that are poor in spirit, that are meek. That's what the king, of course, there will be a physical kingdom someday, but for right now, it's spiritual. And that's the struggle, the hold up a lot of people, just like in Jesus' day, they wanted to make him king. They wanted him to overthrow Rome. But the thing is, it's a spiritual kingdom. And that is essential to the physical, or excuse me, the physical, to a biblical Christian worldview. There are two cities, like, like uh, if you will, two kingdoms. And uh, Augustine said there's the city of God and the city of man. Now let's look at 1 Peter 2.9. 1 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Another scripture talks about uh, shining like lights in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. And that's the point, is that, the, again, the called out ones, it's a spiritual thing. We're not all, in, in, in the church, is a spiritual organism that is called out by Christ. And they're not, we're not all going to look exactly the same. And there's going to be differences and disagreements. You know, we're not all going to be Calvinists or Reformed or cessationists or whatever. <laughs> like some people I know might think that. But there will be those who believe and who have been born again, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and have been saved and have passed from death to life. And that is the church. It's spiritual in nature. And one day there will be a physical, uh, visible church in the age to come. But Jesus used parables. And this is a really important thing, and I'm running out of time here. But Jesus used parables and spoke spiritually because what that did was that hid the truth from unbelievers, and that's actually a merciful thing so that they weren't exposed to more light and therefore more condemnation. But he spoke spiritually in parables. And we see that in Mark 8, 13 through 21, where Jesus spoke spiritually about the leaven, and they thought 
He was talking about literal bread. Or John 2.19 where he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. He was talking about his body. But they thought he was talking about the physical temple. And also in John chapter 3, we see Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And just Nicodemus not getting it. And he was like the top leader in Israel in that day. In fact, Nicodemus means Nick, like Nike, like above Demas, which is just like person, the average person. He was above the average person, and yet he could not understand this because he was part of a system that was devoid of true spiritual truth. But Jesus said, I'm going to hide those things from the wise, and I'm going to reveal them to babes, like children, just little children. He said, that's, that's why he said, in order to be converted, you have to become like a little child. And this, again, it's spiritual. It's trust in him and in his word. And that is the, cent the center of the Christian worldview. So, again, the Christian worldview starts with the Bible. It saturates all of life. It's, it's God-centered. It stands against the culture. It's opposed to the culture. And it is spiritual in nature. It's not physical, political, mental, or any of that. So, uh, forgive me, I'm been going a little long lately and there's actually some things I wanted to get to that I was not able to I will post up that Paris Reed had sermon at the end here uh, but I want to thank you for listening and uh, I'll be putting up another sermon next week and I'll also be starting uh, today I'll be posting up a new series I'm starting of shorter videos called the Faustinos talking about false teachings and actually not really teachers just groups in cults and things that teach false teachings so that you are able to biblically be aware of them and refute them. Uh, so God bless you and may you have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time.